Oh, by the way, I don't know how I missed you bleeping out the god damn it, but boy did that sound hilarious on the actual show. You have very nice show notes, by the way. You have little outlines, bullet points. This is way better show notes than I ever put together. I very much like uh, outlines and show mm-hmm. notes because it allows me to feel safe and secure when I come to the show that I always know what I'm going to be talking about. Mm. But this is quite an outline for the, for the listeners. Mike has an outline that's uh, about four pages long in our shared Google Doc here. And it also is four indentations deep at some points here. Mm-hmm. You have four levels of hierarchy quite the outline questions on questions gray Mm -hmm. there you go so our first piece of follow-up comes from bn cosby on twitter and they found the uh the the background that that Mm -hmm. you couldn't find which is your iphone background yes i looked at that link that does seem to be the artist and the original so we'll put that in the show notes as the wallpaper that i use so thank you to brandon for finding that i actually put it in last episode's show notes as well Mm -hmm. um but the thing is, n- only some podcast apps update the show notes. Hmm. Eagle-eyed observers will have found it in last week's notes. Mm-hmm. But if you know, if you didn't see it in last week's notes, it is now in this week's. And it's an excellent background. It is very nice. I like mine, though, now. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very happy. I spent uh, about 20 minutes aligning it. Uh-huh. Is it actually aligned now? Pretty much. There, there, there is no well. There is no pretty much aligned. It cannot be aligned though, because even with perspective zoom off, mm-hmm. the iPhone will move the background depending on the angle that you look at it. So I can kind of never get it perfect. But as I'm looking at it right now, it is in my dock and it is perfectly still. The line is nice and in between those two dots that I have. I'm pretty sure it doesn't move at all if you have perspective zoom off. It moves very, very marginally, but it does move. I can see it. I can see the line moving between the two dots as I move the phone left and right. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I believe right, you. Okay. I think you've just misaligned it. The thing with misaligning stuff is it's a bit like the uncanny valley where the closer something is to being aligned, but it's not aligned, the more annoying it gets. Whereas if it's just completely misaligned, you think, oh, it doesn't even matter. Who cares? But if, if you're just a couple millimeters off, that's way more irritating than being a centimeter off. I guarantee to you I have perspective zoom off. Mm-hmm. I've taken two screenshots and you will see how it has moved from left to right. Because mm. I know that you won't believe me. I'm now taking a screenshot of the settings where it shows that I have perspective zoom turned off. That proves nothing. Uh... How, what? <laughs> Do you see? Do you see how the line is moving? Well, then then what good is the setting of perspective zoom if turning it off still leaves it on? I don't... Because I, I think perspective zoom is way more than that. Like, it's like the crazy, looks like you're flying through space kind of thing. It's not that I don't believe you, but it's mostly... That it is that you don't that believe That I don't me. believe you, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> maybe maybe I just can't see it on mine because it's not, it's not a perfect grid. But if you take a look at the evidence that I have presented you, mm-hmm. does it appear that I am correct? Sorry, I'm too busy taking my own evidence here. I wasn't really listening to you. What were you saying? You're right. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I'm trying to. Yes. If, if you look at if you look at exhibit A, B, and C, mm-hmm. then you you can you must be able to agree that there is an issue here, that it seems like it is moving, and I have it set as off. I have perspective zoom off on my phone. I've just wiggled it around and taken different screenshots, and the background does not move. I think your phone's just broken. I have another question for you. Uh-huh. Do you have the reduce motion setting turned off? <laughs> Okay, reduced motion is off. Oh, so I well, so it is on mine too, and I can you can clearly see how the icons are moving left to right. I think you're just really bad at aligning wallpaper. I think you just don't know what you're doing. No, nope. your phone is broken. Okay, if you moved your phone to the absolute left, taken a screenshot, move it to the absolute right, take a screenshot. That is exactly what I just did. My wallpaper didn't move. Can you send me them? Damn, I can't believe we're doing this. Yeah, they are exactly the same. I don't understand what's happening here. That, that's what I'm telling you. Right. This this can only be truly resolved when the next time me and you meet for lunch. So I believe that is going to be before we record episode five. I think so. By the time next week's show, this will be finally resolved. Although yes. I, I fear this is one of those things we are going to get many, many, many screenshots about from people's phones. Uh, to, uh, tweet, tweet at you. I'm not interested in receiving people's near identical screenshots. I just, your phone is broken. This isn't. Mine is fine. My phone is works the way I would expect that it would. Graham suggested a Reddit app called iAliens mm-hmm. to me. 
because I said I hated Alien Blue. And mm-hmm. I like this app. Oh, yeah? Have you used it? Yeah, I've been using it um, for the commenting and stuff this week mm-hmm. and, and for looking at our posts on your subreddit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have been way happier with this than Alien Blue. It makes so much more sense to me. Does it have a dark mode? I'm not seeing that in the screenshots. It does, but the, the mm-hmm. contrast of the text is quite low. But it does have a dark mode. That's fine. I'm happy to accept low contrast text for a dark mode. Yep, I might yep. give it a try. I've been you keeping should. my eye out for, a, for an alternative Reddit client because I haven't been thrilled with Alien Blue lately. So. Yeah, you, sh- you should really check this out. I, I like it a lot. It's very simple. Okay, I'll give it a try. Yeah, I, I recommend it. So thank you so much to uh, Graham, who was the first person to send that in to us. Um, we had a few people ask this question, Gray, and, and I must say that I'm I am very interested to understand the answer to this as well because this is something that frustrates me. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you deal with the fact that when you move your uh, iPad into portrait, all of the uh. icons move around and it ruins your uh, all of the work that you've done? Yeah, well, this is the same problem that the iPhone 6 Plus has as well, that if you use it in landscape mode, everything just slides over. That is just ugly as hell, though. Like the on the, it is way worse to look at on the iPhone than yes. the, on the iPhone six plus than on the iPad. Yes, uh, I remember when I first got an iPad. The first time I rotated it and saw that the icons moved around, I was horrified because I knew that this was something I was going to have to live with for quite a while. One of the reasons why I have in landscape mode, I have three rows of icons on my iPad is I think that that is fairly optimal for when you rotate it, it, you're left with, I think it's almost a four by four grid. There's one icon missing at the bottom, I think is the way that ends up. And I don't think it looks too bad when you rotate it, but I hate that. And I don't understand, I don't understand why Apple doesn't adopt what to me seems the most simple solution, which is have the icons rotate in place. I don't understand why they have to realign when you turn something uh, to landscape or to portrait. I don't understand why this is the, this is the solution. So you'd, you'd have the dock on the side, for example, not in the dock wouldn't go to the bottom. Oh oh yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. I, I, yeah. If you put the dock on the side, that's fine. Whatever. I, I'm, I'm less concerned about where the dock is, but because that's that's the less horrible part. There's, yeah. you, know, you can you can do something with the dock. That makes more sense to me, actually. Just turn the icons around. Yes, all of the icons stay in their same spot, but they just rotate 90 degrees when you turn it, and then you then you still have them laid out in the same in the same manner. That's the, that seems to me the reasonable way that when you rotate something, it should work. Well, they wouldn't, though, would they? Because what's in your top left is then in the top right, for example. Yeah, you, you, you can't ever, you can't uh, achieve the thing that you want, which is, oh, I want all the icons in the same relative locations because you're moving a physical object and the, the, the screen ratio is different one way or the other. So you have to do something with moving the icons around. But I think the, the, the visual metaphor is best as if you were taking a, a piece of paper yeah. and you drew icons on it. And then you mm-hmm. rotate that paper. That's what the icon should do. But then, because it's digital, just have them rotate ninety degrees counterclockwise or whichever way, so that they are upright. But they're still in the lo- same location as it as if you were moving a piece of paper. Yeah, like if you're looking at them, they don't shift around. They yeah. stay where they are when you're looking at them. I feel that that makes more sense. It doesn't help the muscle memory problem, but you can't. Like the way that you'd have to yeah. do that, it would look so ugly because you'd have to do all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Muscle memory is going to be broken no matter what you do because the iPad is not a square device. So since you already have to give up muscle memory fidelity, you might as well try to preserve visual fidelity. But they go with breaking both. They go, oh, well, we can't keep muscle memory fidelity. So let's break visual fidelity as well. And I don't understand this decision. My, my guess is this falls out from the way iOS was originally designed to handle rearranging icons. That that's, that's why this is there. This is just old code that hasn't been updated. And that when you rotate it, it's basically just saying, oh, let's pretend like all the icons were lifted up for a second and then we'll just slide them in like we're putting them in place. I think that's why that happens. But I just think it's, it is ugly as sin when it happens. And I'll, anyway, the, the true answer is that I almost always use my iPad in landscape mode anyway. So I, I, I rarely have it in portrait mode. I like it in landscape. And I guess if you use an app in portrait, you put it back to landscape when you're on the home screen, for example. Because I assume like if you read, 
you probably read in portrait, right? No, I read in landscape. Okay, like two pages side by side or one page? Yeah, if I'm if I'm using iBooks, I do the two pages thing where it it has two okay. small pages of text. I like that. Do you use the rotation lock? Yeah, I do use the rotation lock. I mean, some things are better in portrait mode. Like if I am using Instapaper, Instapaper is my one complaint about it is it doesn't do a, a double column thing and then the text is just too wide. So I'll read Instapaper yeah. in, in portrait mode. It's not like it never happens. But the vast majority of my time, I leave the iPad in landscape mode. When I'm doing kind of anything productive, I seem to keep it in landscape. But when I'm reading stuff, like if I'm looking at Twitter or something like that, then I'll, I will look at it in portrait mode. Um, in episode one we covered the various to-do apps that you use. And then many people noticed in last week's episode an app that lives smack bang in the middle of your <laughs> iPad home screen uh-huh. that was not present on your iPhone home screen, and that is Wonderlist, or v- Wunderlist, I think is it's more I'm going to call it Wonderlist. <laughs> yeah, you can, but I like to, to call it Wunderlist. Okay. Because uh, the company that makes it is called Six Wunderkinder, so I, okay. you know, I like to go with Wunderlist. <laughs> you let me know how that works for you in the comments of, of this discussion. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some people will love it. Most people will probably hate it. Mm-hmm. But what do you use Wunderlist for uh, committing? Like, what do you use it for? And why is it just, or is it just siloed to your iPad? Uh, I think, this is again, I, I'm, I'm always trying stuff out. I think it was present in the original screenshots of my iPhone. It was just in one of my work folders. Ah, um, uh huh. That's. Right. I think that that was the case. That would make sense. I I was kind of expecting that that would be the case. But if that is the case, then for some reason it is given pride of place on your on your iPad and not on your phone. Wonderlist is given pride of place <laughs> on my iPad mainly because I have a hard time actually filling all three rows with icons on my iPad. Since that is primarily a work device, there are there are more icons on there than I would if I didn't care about the aesthetics of it. If I was if I was just wanting two rows, I could get away with removing some things on there. So there are more things on my iPad that are higher priority than they would otherwise be on the iPhone, which is why it's slightly different. I did a uh, zoom and enhance um, on the original <laughs> screenshot that you provided. Enhance, Mike, enhance. I have enhanced and I can see Wunderlist tucked away inside your work folder or your Verk folder, I guess. Yes, that's right. It's the Verk folder. <laughs> this is going to end well for you. Mm-hmm. This will not end well for you. No, it will not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, to answer the question is going to have to allude again to a topic that we're going to put off until another time. But uh, I asked Twitter a few weeks ago about to-do list apps that worked particularly well for sharing with somebody else. And uh, Wonderlist was one of the ones that came fairly well recommended. There were a bunch of others. I I spent um, maybe an hour or so trying out a few, and I eventually settled on Wonderlist as the to-do list app that I am currently using to communicate with my personal assistant. So that is a place that I can put tasks for her instead of having to do things in email. This is relatively new. I'm trialing this out. Uh, I don't know if it will stick or not, but that's currently what I'm using it for. Uh, The elusive personal assistant. (laughs) Yes, it's very exciting. So last week, I teased the idea of talking about your video posting um, mm-hmm. and kind of what happens on the day that you post a video because you posted a video last week and, and there were just things that are happening um, in your social media life that I found very interesting and mm-hmm. kind of and I wanted to kind of unpack a little bit of that. Okay. So we can maybe look at some of that today. So I want to start with the actual day itself and kind of talk through a little bit about a day in the life. I think there's some technical aspects of this that I would like to address at a later date. So... The day that videos are posted, I assume that you know about these in advance. Like, they don't just happen accidentally. Like, it's not like you're like, oh, the video's done. I'll post it. (laughs) I can't imagine that you're that kind of person. And, like, you know that it's going to be maybe Wednesday or Thursday, and then Monday rolls around, and you're like, yes, it's going to be Wednesday, and you prepare that way. Yes, I I wish the videos could be almost accidentally finished oh it's done how amazing but that is this (laughs) who put this there yeah that is most certainly not the case yes i am i'm usually aiming for uh, a particular monday tuesday wednesday region that i want to get a video finished by that doesn't always work out because uh, things can take longer but yes i'm usually aiming for a particular day 
and I roughly schedule out the next three months of videos and approximately when I want them to appear. So I do have a, a, a general notion of when I want the, want the videos to happen. But yes, they do get pushed back uh, on occasion. Is that a rolling thing or do you sit and like take time to plan that out at certain intervals? It's both. It's both because things can happen that change what I'm intending to work on. And this is where I, I, I'm usually working on actively working on maybe two or three videos at a time. I don't really like to work on three. I can feel that my productivity goes down a bit, but um, I'm usually juggling a few that I'm thinking about for the next few months. Uh, but yes, whenever I finish a video, after that I do recheck the, the calendar and the schedule and really think about it and say, okay, uh, almost always the video is up later than I wanted it to be and so I have to think about rejiggering the dates for the later ones instead of pretending like I'm some kind of superhuman that's going to magically make up the lost time which never actually happens and so yes hey I have a video <laughs> scheduled for tomorrow <laughs> I mean the, the I, I say that like I do it perfectly but there are definitely times when some part of my brain goes oh no man you're two weeks late for this one you'll you'll definitely make up the lost ground between now and the next one I mean your track record is zero for ever actually doing this but this time will be different uh, my brain does trick me in that way on occasion but I try to be very conscious of uh, if something is late, backing up videos that are in the future and not pretending to myself like, oh, I'm going to magically somehow do it faster than I did before. So the the last video that I just put up, the one about the UK election, uh, that ended up being uh, pretty solidly a week later than I wanted it to be. I think it was actually a lot closer to a week and a half later than I wanted it to be. And so, yes, that that does affect the other videos downstream. It always does. Is there a specific change in your schedule that day that you maybe throw all other tasks out the window? Like, how does that kind of, how does that look? Okay, so let's talk historically what's happened and then what has happened a little bit more recently. Ooh. <laughs> Optimization. The, well, I don't know if it's optimization, but this oh, is... It could be the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Th this is the ongoing story of... of trying to engineer a life that I want to live and, and trying to make changes. And you have convinced me to do Cortex at this very interesting time when I've been very conscious this year about things settling in my business in some ways that I, I feel comfortable making some changes. And this, okay, what I'm about to talk about is one of these changes. So what happened historically for almost every video that I've ever made, the, the animation phase has always been just this horrible, horrible time when I end up staying up really, really late to get it done, to get it finished. How late is really, really late? Okay, so for many of my videos, the answer is I didn't go to sleep. Okay. Uh, the one in particular that I remember was Humans Need Not Apply, where... That video was months and months later than I intended it to be. That one took a long, long time to make. Uh, and that one was quite different from a, a bunch of other videos that I've done, which I think contributed to that. I'd never yeah. done anything quite like that. More like a documentary? Yeah, it, the world's tiniest documentary might be, the, might be the way to describe it. Yeah, it was more the style, definitely. Yeah. Like just in presentation and everything and length and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that one, I remember... I was getting really nervous that somebody else was going to do a big video on that topic. And there were just a, a bunch of things in the news which were kind of contributing to people are talking more and more about robots now. And w when I finally thought this is close enough that I can finish animating this, uh, whatever it was, the day before I just said, right, I'm just going to finish it. And I spent the whole day and I ended up staying up the whole night and publishing it in the in the next morning. That was not uncommon for me to just end up staying up most of the night to finish the animation, to just do it all in one big, one big rush, which was not very good for my physical health and it was not very good for my mental health. But that is the way most of the videos have been made, is just with a huge push at the end. And so... Lately, with the past mm, three videos, maybe four videos, I'd have to look at what that fourth one was. I can't remember off the top of my head. 
I have been trying much harder to not do that, to not stay up all night. Now, I have long days still of animation that I find really boring, but I'm, I'm trying very hard to say, like, you can't stay up anymore, man. Like, you, this is not... This is not a thing that you can keep doing. This is a thing that you could do when you were establishing your video business. But this is a thing that has to stop now. And for the UK one, I animated the whole day before it was released. And I would finish the animations the morning it was released. But I slept a regular night in between those two. So which, was a, which was a nice change. You would have done that on the all the night before until it was finished. Yeah, I would I would have almost certainly stayed up until extremely late at night and then and then gone to bed um, and just not go to sleep until it was finished. So you're kind of in a way giving in a little bit to the part of your maybe giving in isn't the right turn of phrase, but you are allowing the part of your brain which is like hey man someone might do this you're you're just le- like being like well that's going to have to be the case if that's what happens because i need to go to sleep now yeah that's partly what it is it's it's trying to ignore that feeling i get this no matter what the topic is i always get this irrational feeling right towards the end that somebody else is going to put this up right now and of course nobody's doing a video about some nerdetry of the uk election right nobody was going to do that video but it doesn't change the fact that my brain still worries about that the closer we get because it's it's uh it's like my brain is doing some kind of opportunity cost freak out of oh we're so close this would be the worst time for someone to scoop us on a topic so we might as well finish it right now uh and that that has been the freak out and that's usually why the it's very rushed and very panicky the the animation section towards the end and so yes i'm trying to push that back a little bit and it's also just it's also just part of trying to live a, a healthier life, which has been an ongoing goal this year of mine. And I function terribly when I don't sleep well. I'm very sensitive to a lack of sleep. And so I was just like, this is this is not good for me. And and you know, it can ruin the rest of the schedule for a couple of days if I'm if I was up all night and then I don't sleep well the next day. So that's partly why I'm trying to change the way this happens. That's one thing that I wonder about of myself because I push myself very late into the evenings, um, mm-hmm. many days a week, and and I feel like I kind of do okay on it, uh, but it's one of those things where I'm like, I wonder how many more years I have left to, to continue doing this. Well, this is the thing: you don't have an infinite number no. of years. There, there is some finite amount of time, and I have been doing YouTube now for four years or so, and. The things that I did in the first two years would have killed me if I kept doing them for three years. Uh, so I, I know I definitely toned down some stuff in the third year, and and now again I'm finding myself in another phase of trying to figure out how to how to balance personal health and the amount of work that's being done. Because the the trade off here is that it definitely takes longer to do things in a more reasonable way. There's, there's no doubt about that. It takes longer in terms of the number of days. If I make myself stop working sooner, it can take, okay, three working days of animation versus a day and a half of just staying up all night and doing it. That, but that's that's the trade-off. There's always trade-offs. The urgency a little bit is what you lose, I think, which is good because you can't keep that up forever. But it's the urgency that enables you in the first instance to actually go out and do the thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, it's also urgency for a, a thing that is yours. Like, it's it's very different when you are making a thing and you feel this urgent sensation to release it into the world. Where, whereas when I was working a regular job, I could not have stayed up all night and continued to work through the day with teaching stuff. No, I wouldn't. It's just... Yeah. yeah, it just wouldn't happen. There were there were times when there's there's a lot to do, but you know what? You're going to bed at a certain point because you have to get up again in the morning and go into work, uh, and so that that kind of of physical sacrifice is just not not possible for a, a regular job. So on the that day on on posting day, mm-hmm. um, is there a kind of like a war room mentality in great hours? Like, do you do you set up your environment differently? Do you tend to do this stuff at home? 
<laughs> okay, uh, yes, let me tell you about the, the setup, but uh, I just was one one final thing from, from the last point, which is I have, there's a goal that I keep telling myself I'm going to hit and that I have yet to hit, which is I want to get to the point where I am no longer animating on the same day that I release a video. I keep promising myself this will this will happen, that I will say finish the animation on Sunday and then I'll post the video on Monday. But I, I still keep doing like with the UK one, the, the last bit of the animation in the morning and then feeling like, okay, well it's done animating, I'm gonna put it up right now. Uh, even if this doesn't make any sense time-wise about when to put it up uh, because of that, that sensation of urgency of, of it needs to happen now. And the reason I want to do that is because the the you're right, I do have a kind of war room, oh, the, the video is up now, feeling for the day. And I, I don't like mixing a kind of animation stage versus putting it up live stage because there's enough things to do when I put it up live. Someday I hope I'm good enough to separate out those two different kinds of days, but um, I'm not quite there yet. So do you just have, like, I have this feeling of, like, mm-hmm. as soon as something's finished, all it's doing is getting old? Yeah, a little bit. I think that's partly why I find this hard. It, it, particularly with the UK one, is the one I just did is a good example of I uploaded it at not a really great time in the day for the video that it was. I uploaded it at something like about 5.30 UK time. And ideally, I should have waited until the next morning to post that. Uh, 5.30 in, at the in the UK in the afternoon was not a good time for that video. But it, it was done and I, I just, I couldn't, I, was, I couldn't hold back. I was like, I'm just going to put it up now because I just want this to be over with. I want this to be finished. And yes, I definitely have that feeling. It's also a bit weird with, even with doing this podcast with you, I think the last one or something, whenever it is, we the, the last one was done on maybe Thursday night or something. And it's like, oh, we're going to publish it tomorrow afternoon. And it was, it, it was a bit of a strange feeling of, oh, we're just... We're just going to sit on this, I guess. But it's done. Yeah, I don't like it. I hate it. I, I really, really don't like uh, recording things in advance, like mm-hmm. multiple days in advance, unless there is a reason, like I'm going on holiday. Mm-hmm. I always have had this feeling of like, well, it's done now. So all, like that's the thing. all it is doing is getting old. Mm-hmm. Like references are, are, are breaking. Things could happen in the world that mean that something we say is out of date. Like I hate all mm-hmm. of that stuff. Yeah. Someday I may convince you of my philosophy of people don't really care as much about schedules as you think they care about schedules. Oh, I know that. I, I definitely know. I know that I'm the one who cares. <laughs> That's the problem. I think I care more for me than than the concern that other people are going to think that it's weird. You know, like, I know that if, if I see something that makes the show out of date, I'm like, oh, man, look what we've done. Like, perspective zoom has been fixed. Mm-hmm. And, and then I'll be sad. <laughs> Going back to the to the location in the war room, you're at home when, when you post the videos? I, I couldn't imagine you being anywhere else. Posting day is not an iPad day. This is a, no. This would be a very bad day. <laughs> To say, oh, I'm going to go out to a cafe for the afternoon with my iPad, right? My whole business depends on this thing, which happens once every six weeks. And I'm going to make sure that I'm in the least optimal situation to fix anything if there's a problem. So no, this is this is not a day for the iPad. This is a day for sitting at home with my clicky keyboard at my desk and my big iMac. And that is what that is the situation under which I release the videos. Plus, a lot of this stuff is just a thousand times faster to do on the computer because I have this big long checklist of there's so many little boxes to tick and settings to make sure are done in the right way when you're uploading a video that uh, I, I just, it's way easier to do at home of, of yeah, just going through all of those little things. Actually, let me pull it up on OmniFocus. What, how many... I'll pull up my little my template here that people are always asking about. Uh, you called it posting day a moment ago. Yeah. Is that what you call it? Uh, I, I think I don't have any particular. It's not labeled anything in particular. Uh, I mean, like, it's just how you reference the day. Like, what, you know, if somebody said to you, you know, maybe, maybe Mrs. Gray, you're talking to Mrs. Gray and you're like, it's posting day today. And she's like, oh, okay, I'm going to leave Gray alone. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I don't think I have a particular name for it. I just talk about when a video was going live. Right. She does know that uh, when 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 the video has gone live, particularly if she is around when that happens, this is not a time to bother me about anything. So people just know this is do not disturb day. Yes, this is this is do not disturb time. Usually in the evenings, I, I will emerge from the office uh, and then it's okay. But uh, otherwise, uh, I'm very focused on on what's happening, which will sound might sound a little strange when, when I talk about what's actually going on. But it still it still requires a lot of focus. Yeah, there have been times where I have had to ask you something or I've spoken to you about something on a day that a video has gone live, and I just mm-hmm. feel terrible. <laughs> like I'm like I'm concerned that he may like send a dragon to my house mm-hmm. something i i get very you know maybe you like cast a spell on me or something i don't know but it, it i always get very concerned um about asking bothering you of anything on those days especially when i think one day i found a mistake of some description that i was sending you that felt worse that felt way worse <laughs> uh, <laughs> but at least i knew it was a it was a fixable one it's like a typo in a description or something like yeah. that i sent you anyway, i just i just pulled it up here in omnifocus and in my big template that that covers videos from creation to the end phase there are about 35 items that need to happen after the video is complete okay so i i already have the file on my desktop and then what happens from then on there's there're about 35 items and yeah that that's what i'm what i'm grinding through about uploading it to youtube checking that it looks okay on youtube turning off unskippable ads on youtube running through this whole list of things and and now with uh I mean, there's so many places this stuff gets published now now this includes also uploading it to the rss feed and doing all the stuff to get it ready to publish on the rss feed as well and and there there are just so many little buttons to tick and switches to flip about getting it ready to go live in exactly the way that I wanted to go live because w- when I had a, a much smaller audience this stuff mattered way less but now that when I press a button I know it's going to go out to I don't I don't even know what my subscriber numbers are right now it's it's going out to somewhere between one and a half to two million people like it has to be it has to be really ready to go. You can't you can't fix stuff afterward. Uh, I need to have all of the annotations in place. I need to have the captions in place. I need to have the Patreon people all thanked. Like all of this needs to be ready before the I can really press publish. And then there are a few things that happen after that. Because if 0.1% of those people rec- uh, saw an error and told you about it, it's a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the, the, these are crazy numbers. Uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I try very hard not to think about that mm. on the day that I'm actually <laughs> uploading stuff. Yeah, I can imagine that probably helps. <laughs> yeah. I am very aware of the audience when I'm creating the video but I try really hard not to think about it at the at the moment when I'm getting stuff ready to go live because it is not helpful. It is not helpful at all. I mean, I I can sympathize with this on a on a small scale. Like my audience size or our audience sizes are nowhere near as big as those, but they're still large enough that when I'm posting things, I'm seeing it as a purely functional thing that is happening. Mm-hmm. That I do this and then something happens. I don't mm-hmm. think of it like I'm going to send this out to the tens of thousands of people that are out there in the world. Like I don't mm-hmm. think about that. I just mm-hmm. think about right. I go to this place and I click that checkbox and I copy this link and I test it and then I put it in the CMS and I publish. Mm-hmm. And then it's like that's the end. Mm-hmm. Like nothing else happens past that point. Is kind of the way my brain works. It's like you mm-hmm. press publish episode and you can and you're done. That's fine. Mm-hmm. You can just go away. Then you can move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How big is that OmniFocus list in total? Because you mentioned, I assume it's like broken down into certain points. The the broad categories are are the script writing process, the audio creation process, the animation, the thing that I call uploaded, which is everything from export to button press of it goes live, and then I have another whole section which is everything that needs to be done once it's post public, once it's out actually in the world. So th- those are the the various categories that it's broken down into. Uh, and can I see 
how many are in the list as a whole? I always forget. I think it's about 70 something now. It's every time I go through and uh, make a video, there's always something on this list that ends up getting slightly changed or that I, I, uh, I improve a little bit or I change. So this is a real living document for me. It's something that is, is constantly getting better each time that I use it and is like a, a message to future me about what you should do slightly differently next time. Um, How much of that stuff on that list you would you just would do from memory, but you put it there anyway? It's just a confirmation. Because I imagine that about 95%, maybe even 98% of the YouTube publishing system, you could just do that without needing to consult that document because you've done it enough. Okay. To answer your previous question, I just looked. There are 73 items currently okay. on the list. That number goes up and down a little bit. Now, here is the thing that I have learned about myself. And this is one of the reasons why I am so systems focused is I will overestimate how much I will remember if I don't look at the checklist. So it never fails that on an upload day, I am way more confident that I, that I am remembering and doing everything than I actually am. And it... Even though I know this, it still doesn't change how the day actually goes. It, it, you know, it's like, a, it's almost like an optical illusion or something. Like when you're looking at an optical illusion, you know, oh, there's nothing moving on the page, but it looks that way. And there's a part of me which knows you can't possibly be remembering all of this stuff if you're trying to do this without the checklist. But my brain always returns, oh, no, we remember. We remember it all. Everything's great. So this is one of the reasons why I really stick to the checklist. And there was a, a very good example of this just happened, which was... So, so Brady and I did this this different episode of Hello Internet. And the main thing about it was that there was a video in addition to the audio of it. Now, on my putting up an episode of Hello Internet checklist, I have very many things. I have a separate checklist for when I'm uploading a video to the Hello Internet YouTube channel. For some some reason that I can't conceive of, when Brady gave me the video file for our special episode, I thought, oh, I'll just put this up. I don't need to invoke the template. Let me just do this now. And Brady must have found four or five things that were missing from the video when I put it live of just little stuff that wasn't where it was supposed to be or I didn't put in the annotation or I forgot something in the description. And it was just a perfect example of you can't remember these things. Just go through the checklist. There's always something that you're going to forget. And the the Hello Internet YouTube video checklist is only 18 items long. It's not some crazy long list. But it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that I'm very likely to overlook some small thing when I'm actually putting it up. I heard you laughing. Did you think 18 is a long list? I don't think that's a long list. I think it highlights how differently me and you use these systems. Hmm. Um, like, for example, I would be more likely to just have post-episode one task. Right. I, I understand that, but yeah. I, I learned that this doesn't work well for me. No, no, no. That's a, that's, that's a difference <laughs> in the system, which is interesting. And I, I sometimes think that maybe I could do a little bit more. And there are, there are some very special projects that I have these longer lists for. Like, for example, I have found that the most, the biggest thing that I can do in this regard is the first episode of a brand new show. There are so many tiny details that need to go into getting that right. And that is one thing. It has to be right. That is a perfect example of the kind of task that really benefits from a checklist because it is infrequent enough that it's going to feel new every time you do it. And it is also complicated enough that it's not always immediately obvious what you need to do. And so that that is prime that is prime checklist territory for for that kind of that kind of task, but so yeah, I have learned that I need to do these things, um, and I, and I always uh, the one uh, another another small example of just me being kind of dumb. 
which I think in some ways this show is, people are like, oh, he's so pro- productive. And it's, it's really more about like the story of a man who is not very productive, trying to figure out how to become very productive. <laughs> it's the way I think about my life. But uh, for some reason, I used to always just trust myself to remember to upload the captions part of the videos. That wasn't on my checklist for a long time because I just thought, oh, it's just obvious enough. I'll just always do this. I'll just remember. But... YouTube eventually changed the way that captions were done, and so it became less obvious to me to do it. And then I felt really terrible because I actually got contacted by a number of deaf subscribers to my channel who were saying, oh, I just wanted to let you know, like, the the captions seemed to be broken on your last couple of videos when they went live. And I thought, oh, God, now I feel really terrible. And so then, like, you need to add this. Even even things that you you are confident that you can remember situations can change around you and so it is still helpful to have that item to check off yes upload captions make sure they're working before the video goes live even if you think you're always going to remember it you won't and you don't know how things are going to be in the future yeah and that's one of those things you don't want to get those emails yeah you just feel bad yeah yeah i feel like a jerk do you still get nervous when you put the videos up like, do you kind of, like, does your mouse hover over the publish button for a few moments before you press it? Like, checking, double-checking, triple-checking, and then it's like, ah, press the button and run away? <laughs> I have gotten better about that, but it is partly because on on posting day, which we're now calling it apparently, yep. I have started to do a thing where I release the video in small phases to try and help catch any problems that might arise. And so what I do at the moment is when I have most of the animations done, I have a reward on my Patreon page, which I call the the Grammar Nazi perk, or the Grammar Nazi sneak peek is what is exactly what I call it. And I post a preview of some of the animations to a, a very small section of my Patreon supporters. And so they can look and see if there's any dumb mistakes that are on there. And they're, they're very good. Those people catch stuff that I would never see in a million years. I can't always fix all of it depending on, on how minor the error is and how many slides they're, they're on. Uh, like one of the things that will happen sometimes is inconsistent capitalization in words. Uh, but then that inconsistent capitalization is across a hundred frames. And it's like, I can't possibly fix this now. It's not going to happen. But if there's anything major, I will I will fix it then. And then when the video is actually up on my uh, YouTube page, I also now send out an early preview to a small section of the people who subscribe to my email list. There's a I use a, a spreadsheet to create a random subsection of the people who are subscribed to the email list, and I send it out to them. And th- that is a moment of like of, of very much trusting my audience because I don't want those people sharing that publicly yet. And so far, I haven't had any problems, so I can keep doing it. But I'll usually end up sending it to you know maybe a thousand people or so. And sometimes they will catch something at the last moment that's a minor problem. And I have changed stuff based on what those that preview group has seen so by the time i'm ready to press the actual publish this to a million people button it has been through two layers of people seeing it to some extent in advance and with this very last video i tried uh, even one third layer which is to post it on the patreon page first as an unlisted video so that the patreon all the patreon people then can then see it first for a few minutes just to make sure okay there's not any deal breaking problem and then having it finally go live so that has definitely reduced the oh god i hope everything is correct feeling that i used to have is being being able to rely on my audience to help me find stuff that would be deal breakers in the video before it goes out to absolutely everyone I want to come back to that in just a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but what is the first thing that you do when you post? Do you like get up and walk away for a few minutes? Like, what is the first thing if you can even remember? Or does it all just get a bit hazy? 
No, the, the very first thing I do after I make the video public is I create the official Reddit discussion link. Right. That That is right afterward because it, I... That I, is important to you, isn't it? To, to make sure you get in there and do that? Yes, I want that to be there as quickly as possible for people because people love to comment right from the beginning and especially my videos aren't that long where people can watch a video in four or five minutes yeah and people are ready to have feedback right away so i want to make sure that the reddit link is up as quickly as it can be as soon as the video is public i've noticed that with cortex actually like you put we coordinate the release so you can get the the the, the reddit thread up mm-hmm. and as soon as it's there, people comment on it to be too excited about the fact that the episode's there, mm-hmm. like before they've even listened to it. So that is definitely a thing, which is very interesting. Yeah, I like to have it up. I, I do know that a that there's some small section of the audience that uses Reddit generates an RSS feed for every subreddit. And so there are some people that use the Reddit inbuilt RSS as notifications for when new things are up. Uh, so that that's a way of also just notifying some people that it is there. We see it. Like I, I see the numbers spike. Yeah. yeah, I like to have that that available as quickly as possible. So that is that is the very first thing that I do when I put the video up. And then there's a, there's a few other things on the checklist, but that's the one that I really want to make sure is there because it it is because the the Reddit thread for me becomes the central place in which I'm gauging how the thing is going, how are people reacting to it, what are people commenting on. Uh, That's that's the other reason why I want it up as as fast as possible. But no, I don't don't press the button and then go for a walk around the block or something because there's always the possibility that there is still some kind of disaster that that people haven't caught. So you basically, Uh, there is no break, right? It's just you do it and then the next phase begins. That is right. As soon as it's live... Uh, there are a bunch of things that I do, and there isn't a break. I, I don't come back to the computer in a little while. I'm usually at my desk for a couple of hours at least after the video goes live. Some of some of the people I know on YouTube, they they, uh, they post videos and then they're not as obsessed with following it right away. I have known people. I'm not going to name names, but I have known people who have set videos to publish while they are on transatlantic flights completely separate from the world. And I could not live like that. I, I would freak the hell out on an airplane if I knew that one of my videos was was going up at that moment and I wasn't around in case there's some kind of problem or just to see what the feedback is like. But some, some people are, are braver than me. When you start posting things to Reddit and to Twitter and to mm-hmm. everywhere else... Are you basically just going from tab to tab, refreshing things to make sure that things aren't broken? Like, is that kind of the first thing? Like, less about the actual content of the feedback and whether people like the video, but more like there is a period of time where it's like, I need to ensure that this is okay. I'm mainly focusing from the beginning on making sure that it's working, that there aren't problems somewhere. And usually i mean if the video is five minutes long if there isn't some comment about a real problem in the first 15 minutes there usually won't be and so after that i can calm down a little bit more and then and then switch into talking with people on reddit about the video and trying to gauge what the reaction is to see oh what do people like what do people comment on and uh, a a particular favorite of mine is seeing uh, if people spot some of the little jokes or the little references that I'll put into the video. I'm always really pleased when people find something that I add that's only there for a frame of the video or the, or they just notice a little detail that I put in. I'm always very happy about that. So so after the first 15 minutes, I can relax a little bit and then it's much more about how is this video going. What is, no, my understanding is if there is an error of some description, mm-hmm. YouTube makes this very difficult to no. to rectify. Like it's basically the case of delete and start again. Yeah, that that is that is the only option that YouTube provides at this time, is that you need to delete and start again. Which probably makes the stakes higher. Like for example, if there is an error in our shows, I hate it and I fix it as soon as I can, but I'm mm-hmm. less freaking out about it because I know I can fix it. And yeah, unfortunately, the people that have already downloaded it will either hear the problem or they mm-hmm. can just re-download the episode because I will replace it. 
I can just mm-hmm. replace things in our system with the new audio file. It's very easy for me to do that. Mm-hmm. So I would assume that, you know, it probably heightens the sense of needing to do things correctly if the system that you publish to does not allow for mistakes to be corrected yes. uh, within the actual videos. So what is the threshold of mistake? How bad does it need to be? <laughs> do you have an idea in mind of how bad it needs to be? And tell me about a time when it has been that bad. Okay. Uh, I have been... I don't want to say that I have been fortunate or lucky, uh, even though I have, but that's not the, the best word to use. I, I have been lucky that I have never had a a stake through the heart kind of error or mistake in one of the videos where someone leaves a comment and I realize, oh, they just killed my video dead. I did something that was that was wrong or there was a thing that I didn't consider that completely changes this video. Now, the reason why I don't want to say that I'm I'm lucky is because I do spend a lot of time trying to ensure that this doesn't happen and that I am the person who puts the stake through the heart of my video when I am working on it and hopefully as soon as possible that I find something that makes me realize, oh, this video, I should not make this video any further or this argument that I'm I'm putting together falls apart because of X, Y, or Z. So, so I, I haven't had that happen yet. <laughs> so I, I, I have been lucky in that sense, but I have also worked very hard to try to make sure that that never happens. But nonetheless, I have on two occasions I've that I can remember off the top of my head, I've pulled the video after it's gone live and it causes it causes problems one of the ones uh was for the holland versus the netherlands one and i i pulled it for something that i normally never would which was there was a slide where i had the flags reversed for france and the netherlands which is just embarrassing it makes me look really stupid uh and the video went live and people pointed it out almost immediately and because that was one of the rare videos that was a, like a pleasure to make from beginning to end. Everything just worked. I, I, I knew that I really liked this video. Everything about it was just great. It, I knew it was going to kill me to have that flag reversal in the future. And so when it went up, people immediately noticed. I pulled it down right away. I was able to, to fix it and re-upload the new version within maybe an hour or so. And then put it out live so that that's something that i changed if it if it had been a different video uh let's say for example my um uh how many countries are there video if there was some slide on there where flags were reversed i might not have have changed that it would depend on the context but the holland versus uh the netherlands one it was just a video that i liked so much i didn't want it to have and just a dumb stupid problem like that so that, that's one that I pulled. Um, the other one that I pulled was, there wasn't an error. I need to be a bit vague about that, but, but this. But we'll just say there was a section that needed to be removed from uh, my 10 animal misconceptions one. And that was, that was one of the cases where it was a real problem because that video had been up for a little bit. And when you're posting to a big audience, one of the things that can happen is, other websites are going to link to your video. The way the publishing world works sometimes is that they uh, they will load the video basically into a long line of videos that are going to be distributed out through the rest of the day. And so someone sees someone who works at a website sees my video and they say, oh, we're going to post that. They put it in their system and they, they'll time it to be released in three or four hours from now. And with the... Uh, with the 10 animal misconceptions video, I heard from a bunch of publishers who were annoyed because my video had been long, up long enough for them to see it and to schedule a link to it. And then I pulled it down and changed it, but then their links are all dead when their video goes live, when their story goes live later, and then they look dumb that they've, they've linked to a, a broken video or a video that's no longer there. 
Plus, there's also just the pressure that so many emails go out in the YouTube system that when you pull something down, all of those links now no longer work. And again, it's like, oh, great. I just sent out several hundred thousand emails, all of them with a, a link that doesn't work. And then I'm going to have to resend out a message with a link that does work to all of these people. So that's why the, the bar is pretty high for when am I going to pull down a video at the last moment, which is why I haven't done it very often. How does this process feel in relation to posting a podcast episode? Because I assume it's less pressure. Oh, yeah, the, the podcast is is way less pressure. It's way less pressure because you are dealing with the same system that I am dealing with where uh, sometimes something is wrong with the podcast when it gets exported, like the audio falls out of sync for a little bit or there's some kind of dumb mistake. It's very easy to fix. It doesn't cause massive problems. And yes, the people who downloaded it originally might hear an audio glitch or something in the podcast, but it can be fixed for the future, and then that's fine. I can I can relax about that. I don't have to worry about that. It's still annoying. I still don't like it, but it it is nowhere near it is nowhere near the kind of pressure that it is with the videos. It's just because of YouTube system of not allowing you to change it, which. I don't know. I, I think it's dumb. I think I think YouTube should be able to trust users that have millions and millions of subscribers to know what they're doing if they want to change something in a video. Uh, I know that they have that system in place because they don't. They're trying to uh, prevent like fraud or people taking advantage of viral videos. But I just think like, come on, guys, you should if you have have regular content producers doing this every week. I think you can I think you can allow it to let them change a video if if they uh if they deem it necessary but it's not the case. Like there could be a contract that you would sign to say that you won't do X. Yeah. Uh, that you know that would be great. I mean I I've, I've heard you know whispers on the grapevine that that maybe there's a way that if I if I do the right kind of secret handshake if I go to YouTube headquarters that someone can manually swap out a video if it's a real problem. But like, you know what, I don't want to have to rely on that or, or like pull in favors to get a video swapped out. I just, it's, so th that kind of thing then ends up annoying me more. It's like, oh, so you're telling me it's technically possible, but you're just not doing it for some, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I assume with responding to emails and Twitter, well, not emails, Twitter and Reddit and, <laughs> and stuff like that. Definitely not emails. <laughs> and I'm assuming you probably don't do a lot with YouTube comments. Every once in a great while, I will respond to a YouTube comment because on posting day, very often I'm going back to the page where the video is for some reason. I want to copy the URL or I just want to refresh it and see what the view numbers are. And so every once in a while, the comment that is at the very top, I will reply to. But that is, is pretty rare because the YouTube comment system, I mean, everybody makes fun of it. People at YouTube seem weirdly proud of it sometimes. I talk to engineers like, oh, we did a great job, you know, re reworking our comment system. And it's like, okay, well, it might have been garbage before, but it's still a pile of garbage now. Um, so the YouTube comment system is just useless, which is why I don't really participate in it. It's it's absolutely terrible. So that that is why, for me, the actual conversation takes place on Reddit, where, which has a which has reasonable algorithms for sorting comments and allowing people to vote stuff up and down. It's like it's not rocket science how to do a comment system that is reasonable, but for some reason Reddit seems to be one of the very few places that actually does it. So the video has been up and it's been out for maybe an hour or two. Mm -hmm. What's happening then? Like what is, what is that like? This is where on my computer. I'll see if I can drag it up. I took a screenshot once of, of what this looks like. But on my Mac, I, on the day it has gone live, it's it's been up for a little bit, I like to put up on the screen the YouTube allows you to have real-time analytics. So you can see how many people are watching the video right now. Oh, man. Where, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where are they? Where are they coming from? Uh, and that is very interesting to see. Yeah, there goes the day. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> just staring at the numbers. Well, I don't really stare at the numbers, but I'll, I'll put I'll put up the screenshot. I usually, uh, and they'll actually do that for websites as well. And so I will usually pull up and put to one side of the screen the live view of what is happening on the YouTube page right now 
and then what is happening on cgpgray.com right now. And one of the things that allows me to do is to try to figure out occasionally when traffic spikes occur, if some big place links to the video, I want to know when that happens. And so I can see in the live stats of like, okay, um, you know, there were a thousand people on cgpgray.com right now, but all of a sudden it's gone up to 5,000 in the last 30 seconds. Where did they come from? And I, I want to be able to track that down. So I, I will have that on one side of the screen. And what I'm doing for the rest of the day is I have those stats up. I, I will usually have uh, Twitter on the other side of the screen so I can see uh, the app mentions coming in. And I'll have Reddit in the center of the screen where I'm talking to people and, and if I can, answering questions and stuff. Like th that to me is, is the enjoyable part of this process is it's been up for a while. There's no problems. I can see how it's doing. And also now I get to talk to people on the Reddit. Like that's a, like I really like engaging with people, talking about the video, like making jokes and all this other stuff on the Reddit while I'm keeping an eye on how are things going with the real-time stats and how are things going uh, on Twitter on the side. So that's that's what I'm looking at for a large portion of the day. And the other thing that I will do, which some people on the Reddit know, is that at a certain point, there really isn't much to do anymore. I've, I've answered most of the, the unique questions that are coming in on the Reddit. So questions just start getting duplicated. And I can see, okay, the video is fine. I probably had all the traffic spikes that I'm going to have at this stage. And then I'll often, I will be basically alt tabbing between this overview screen and I'll have a video game on some other screen. So I'll flip over to the game for 20 minutes, play a little bit, and then I'll flip back and see, okay, how's everything doing? Are there any new comments that came in that I, I want to reply to? And then I'll flip back to the game for another 20 minutes and then flip back. So that, that's what I'll, I'll do probably around until dinner time, at which point I feel just absolutely exhausted and emerge from my office to have dinner and then usually sit on the couch like a brain dead zombie for the rest of the day and watch Arrested Development or something. So you stop. Well, when I'm sitting there watching Arrested Development, at this stage, I, I switch. I will have my iPad with Reddit on it, and I'll keep an eye a little bit on, on what's happening on, on Reddit. But at that point, you have to realize on these long days, I have been animating in the morning. I've gone through the whole process of releasing it to the world. I've been keeping an eye on, on the comments. At that point, I'm pretty tapped out for my cognitive abilities. So I will usually not be doing very much except doing the like the minorest of eye keeping on with with my iPad on the couch that's where I end up so what about the next day I always play this this little game with myself which is how long can I go before I look at how the video is doing in the morning this is a this is a funny side effect of living in the UK because the rest of the world is is still awake and yeah. doing things mm -hmm. when we go to bed in the UK. I love the UK time zone, by the way. I think it is really great, especially for someone who has an internet career. Uh, I like it quite a lot. But it does mean that significant things can happen sometimes between the point at which I go to bed at, like, say, 10 o'clock at night and when I get up in the morning. Sometimes there can still be big sites that link to it or another discussion that flared up somewhere about the video. So I, I do I do go for how long can I, I go without checking in the morning. But usually I don't make it past breakfast before I have to whip out my iPad and say, okay, what are the what are the view numbers at? How is this doing? I usually plan on having a kind of unofficial weekend after the video goes up. That may not actually be on the weekend. Usually it isn't. But I don't plan to do any real work for the day or two after a video goes live. And it's, it's again, usually because the run-up to launching the video is very intense. And I've learned from experience that if I try to get right back into writing scripts for the next video immediately the following morning, like I normally would do if it was a normal day, 
that just doesn't work out. I'm, I'm still tapped out. I usually need at least one day, and I normally take two off. And that's, that is just pure downtime. Usually I will just veg out and play video games, or I have a list of movies and stuff to watch, and maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll watch them. And then this still allows a, a, an occasional checking in with seeing how Reddit comments are, seeing what people are saying on Twitter. But by the second day, that's died down pretty much. And then after that, I feel, okay, I'm recovered. And now it's, start, it, now it's time to pick up on the, the next video that is closest to release wherever you left off and start gr- grinding away on that one and bring that one forward to a publication day. One of the things we spoke about last time was the fact that you remove core applications from your iPhone, um, like a very, very interesting person. And you mentioned on posting days, Mm -hmm. uh, you not only put Safari back on, Mm -hmm. uh, you also put Alien Blue and TweetBot onto your devices. Uh, Yeah, on my phone, Safari usually stays off, but... On the video day, yeah, um, Alien Blue and Tweetbot go back on the phone uh, in that space on the bottom is is the way that normally works. So the reasoning for this being, because you're at home, so you've got the Mac. So why did he come back? The reason for this is that almost certainly at, at some point before dinner, I will I will have to get up and like take a walk around the okay. block just to just to get out of the house for a minute and then I can have Tweetbot and Alien Blue on the phone and it's there in case I, I want to look at anything I usually don't but it's there just in case and then it, it also they just stay on the phone for this this sort of unofficial weekend that I take and this way if I, I go for a walk in the park or I go somewhere I can then at any moment if I want respond to some comments if anything interesting comes in or if people say anything on Twitter. So during this phase, I like to have those things accessible, but it's because it's a very different phase of my life. The video is on my mind. It is useful to be checking stuff now in a way that three days after a video goes live, it's not useful anymore to be checking on how things are doing. The the big, like 90% of the wave is over at that point. There, there's no reason to keep checking stuff anymore. And so that's why the those apps then come off uh, after two days after the video has gone up. Do you do anything with notifications during this period of time? Because there's something to be said for like going and checking Twitter over and over again to see if there's anything bad other than just having notifications and they just come to you so you see them as they happen. Yeah, I used to I used to allow notifications from these apps uh, after a video had gone up, but I realized that, that this, does, this is actually not very helpful to have the notifications come in because then if I'm, I'm taking a quick walk, I'm just distracted now and it slightly defeats the purpose of the walk. So I don't allow the notifications on there. I just have it if I feel like I want to take a look at them, then I, then I will open the app. But I, I don't have it beep every time someone leaves a comment on Reddit. Because it sounds like posting a video makes a really big impact on your life. Like, it derails <laughs> things for, like, four days, you know? So yeah, that's, yeah that, is, that is fair to say that the minimum derailment is, is four days. The two days of animation posting and then two days off work. So uh, essentially effectively more often than not maybe it it basically blows out a week yeah that, that, that's fair enough to say do you think that this impact is maybe one of the things that prevents you from making more than you do well how do you mean that well both i guess emotionally and time wise the, the with the way that you do things and the way that you react to things and, and how you you take them and deal with them Every time you post a video, you lose one whole week, which mm-hmm. pushes everything else out further mm-hmm. again. So maybe imagine if you had a video every week, it would never work, right? Mm-hmm. Because you'd never be able to take that time off, which then also means you can't do every two weeks, right? Mm-hmm. So do you think that it affects you? I have tried very hard to do more animation sooner, but I have just found that this 
it takes longer trying to spread it out into six afternoons instead of just two or three solid days. So, so there are there are ways in which I think if I was if I was able to lessen the impact of that one week, it might actually take longer overall to make videos. I don't I don't think I would ever get rid of the two days off because quite frankly, I look forward to that as a huge relief. It's your gift. <laughs> Thank God. Like I put this thing up, it's done, it's over. And now I'm going to take two days of just guilt-free, I don't have to do anything. I mean, this is something else that we can talk about on, on another show. But the the biggest downside of being self-employed is the, the constant feeling that there is always something you could be doing. There's, there's never not more, more that you can do. And... Again, th- like this year, I have been trying very hard to carve out one day a week regularly where I don't do any work and I can just spend time with my wife. And that has that has been very hard to actually achieve, to have one day where I say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do work on this Saturday. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the, the two days of... Of relaxing after the video goes up they are they are important because it's the only time that my brain can really let go and say you don't need to be working on a video right now because you just put up a video you just put up a video nobody is expecting a video three days from now that's not going to happen you can actually just relax and see how this one see how this one turns out yeah so this is what i was like thinking about and getting at because it's like you, you know the scheduling thing and we're going to talk about scheduling at some point as well mm-hmm. but i know it's something that many people always ask you like you know give me more videos and mm-hmm. there is an element is if you made more videos you would make more money you could double your income right yeah so there are definite reasons for you that you would want to make more videos i always joke with people but it's not a joke that nobody has more reasons to release more videos than me yeah it, 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 but people don't seem to believe that it's 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 a very interesting position to be in but because of the there there's maybe something just about you that prevents you from doing that because of the way that you approach this stuff and that you need to have take that time to build yourself back up again to like take that break and, and carry on like so it's not it's not really a criticism or a comment or anything like oh, that no, but no. it's just it, it feels like that this is part of the reason that the schedule if you'd call it that, is as it is. Yeah, the, um, the the thing that I've tried to explain on Reddit a few times is like what, what we're talking about today, all of this stuff, we're talking about some of the details about what happens just before and just after launch day. But the real bottleneck in the whole process is actually the writing, which is the part that nobody sees and is, is the least interesting interesting to many people in some ways is, is is how the writing happens and that that is the one part that is the slowest part where the animations all, are all waiting on a completed script and I have I have come to terms over the past year with the speed at which I write which is apparently very slow compared to other people who write and I I don't think that there is anything that I can try that I haven't already tried to increase that. I am working at optimal capacity for my writing. And that is really the part that slows the whole thing down. If scripts just appeared completed, I could do more animations. You know, I could release a video every three weeks instead of every six weeks if scripts just appeared. That would be possible. Uh, but it is it is really the scripts that slow down the whole process. That is the true bottleneck. Could you hire anybody to make any of this any easier? <laughs> or is there an element which is, I think, perfectly fine, which is something that you complain about me a lot, to me, that the way that I work. Do you feel that you have to do this stuff yourself? Like, you could give it to somebody, but you just can't give it to someone. Oh, this this is a whole other topic. Yeah. I, I, will, say, I will say in brief to answer that question that I have attempted to hire people to help me out with it and 
for the kind of thing that I do, it has always been a negative amount of help. That it is, it is worse and takes longer than doing it myself. The the kinds of things that I can have people help me out with. Um, yeah, I, I have had people. I have tried to hire people to help me with certain parts of the animation, which are just tedious to do but easy to explain, and. It's always come back in a way where it's like, oh, great. Well, now I just have a thing to fix. And then fixing this thing takes longer than it would have just taken for me to do it, plus the time that it takes to explain to the person and then the back and forth. So th that has that has not worked out well. I will casually reference here. Maybe we can talk about it at some point in the future. I did at one point... People know I have very many secret projects that I'm always working on. One of the secret projects that I killed was attempting to put together a new YouTube channel in which I would work in an editorial function and try to manage a team of people to put that, to put out videos on a much more frequent basis. But that also just, that did not work out for a variety of reasons that, that we can talk about. I think that kind of project of starting something from the beginning with the idea of this is going to be a, a team of people who makes things that has way more possibility to succeed. But my videos, it's very hard to have people help me. I, I, I occasionally have a little bit of help with the fact checking, but the animations and the script are so closely connected that it, there isn't room for someone else to really help out with this. We are gonna look at a case study of the Grey Editorial YouTube channel at some point in the future and, and try and understand why it didn't work. <laughs> I don't I don't know if we I don't know if we will, but I just I people always wonder what my secret projects are and I don't often like to talk about them, but this Well, you have just revealed one, so you know, I think it would be very interesting to take a look at that as a as a as a uh, to try and understand a little bit more around the whole processes we talk about is how far you let that go before it was like no this isn't going to work. Yeah, that was that was killed in the relatively early stages for a bunch of reasons. But we'll, yeah, we'll save that. We'll save that for later. Let's do some Ask Gray. All right. So Matthew via Twitter asked, do you have a work uniform? So do you have clothes that you wear every day? Do you have clothes yeah. that you wear on specific days to, to pair with different tasks? This is a common piece of advice for the self-employed. And especially the newly self-employed, which is don't show up to your work in your jammies. <laughs> you know, pretend like you're still a respectable member of society and actually get dressed for work. And this is something that I definitely did when I first started working on my own. <laughs> but now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did this in the beginning and I did find it helpful. Uh, but it was partly that I, I used to have this whole set of, of white collared shirts that I used to wear to work my actual job all the time. Of course, in my actual job, I had to wear a tie and a blazer. I was very happy to ditch those. But when I first started working on my own, I did stick with, okay, I'm going to try to put on the white collared shirt and this is, this is me working. And then at the end of the workday, I'm going to take it off and just put on a regular t-shirt. I I think it was a little bit helpful at the beginning, but I I dropped that after a while. Uh partly because those white shirts were coming to their end of their life and I thought I'm not I'm not going to buy more white business shirts. This isn't going to happen. I think that's a bit of um I don't want to say a crutch because I know people who still do it and find it useful, but for me it, it was a it was a it was a crutch that helped me get over the this like difficult transition of being employed to being self-employed i don't feel like i need that now but it's also because i have a really hard time finding a men's collared shirt that i find acceptable and this has been a frustration in my life for years i think in the week that i became self-employed i took all of my i used to wear suits i had to wear suits to work full suits mm -hmm. i took all of them and i put them into vacuum bags mm -hmm. and i did the vacuum thing to them to take all the mm -hmm. air out, and now they have been under my bed, and they will—they do not come out. 
<laughs> until a couple of weeks ago when I needed a soup for something and it was like right. oh man I had to go, I had to go in those bags and and I pulled it out but uh I over the over many years have accumulated a large selection of nerdy t-shirts mm-hmm. um t-shirts for different podcasts that I like for different websites that I like and I mm-hmm. never really had the chance to wear them mm-hmm. you know I'd maybe wear them for like PJs or whatever, but mm-hmm. but now they are my uniform. I get to wear my nerdy <laughs> t-shirts every day, and it makes me very happy. I'm still looking for a daily wear uniform for myself, just in the sense of I want things to be the same all the time, but I, I have not satisfactorily found shirts that work for this. Like I have a, a set of black t-shirts that I normally wear, but I, I, I'm, I'm always on the quest for the perfect black t-shirt. And it's the same thing with a collared shirt. Like, I'm on a quest for the perfect collared shirt. And sometimes I go into stores and take a look at their shirts, and they're always they are always lacking to me, and it is sad. But when I find the perfect shirts, this day will happen one day. I will just buy a hundred of them. So I just have them, and they are always the same. But, uh, uh, yeah, everything that I have come across is, is sadly lacking. To save him from needing to send you a message in some description... Marco Arment will suggest to you to check out Uniqlo. Uniqlo? Yeah. He ha- he buys black t-shirts, I believe, from Uniqlo and says that they are they are the perfect t-shirt that he has found. Because he Marco does that, right? He has just the same t-shirt and the same jeans. Mm-hmm. He just has lots of them and just wears them. This is Marco Arment yep. of ATP. Yep. Uh, but they don't... It does, yeah, okay. Do they have collared shirts, though? Oh, no. This is for the t-shirt. Okay. Here, Internet, you're going to help me out here, Internet. Listeners of Cortex. Here's, here's what I want in a black collared shirt. I don't think I'm asking for a lot, but apparently this is like asking for the moon. I want a black collared shirt, long sleeves with a pocket on the left-hand side. I want the buttons not be shiny white or anything I want them to be black matte buttons and I don't know the name for this but I want the the bottom part of the shirt to be a straight cut around do you know what I mean Mike do you know this term for this you're a fashionable guy you know how some men's shirts they have like semicircles in the front and back and some men's shirts are cut flat what is that you should know this term I have no idea but I know exactly what you're talking about yeah you know what I'm talking about so I want it cut flat on the bottom and this is this is always the deal breaker part. I want a shirt that doesn't wrinkle all to hell at the slightest touch. I, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be ironing my shirts. This is not going to happen. I have I have honestly thought about trying to found my own colored shirt manufacturing company. <laughs> I was like, listen, <laughs> what is it going to take? Like, how much how much startup money do I need here to purchase time? At a clothing factory where I can be like, okay, here's what I want. I want like a man's shirt, but I want it to be wrinkled free. I want it to do this. Like what could it possibly take? And then I'll start a company that just sells one kind of men's collared shirt. I have no joke seriously considered doing this because I cannot find a collared shirt that is acceptable to me. You seem to think this is funny. I just like the idea that you said that you have seriously considered starting your own clothing brand yeah basically i really have i like i, I have looked into how this works if you want to get clothing manufactured <laughs> you, should talk, you should talk to matt uh daniel over twitter would like to know what your preferred email app is okay for some reason this seems to be a controversial choice i like mail.app I use Apple's uh, mail. Bl- yes, okay, listen, this is you. What? Okay, why? Why is this no good? I have one major problem with mail uh-huh. uh, that I don't know why this happens. If you are reading an email, so you have an email open, and you reply to an email, or you archive an email, it opens the next email and then marks that email as read. That is yeah. not what I wanted to happen. Just because I deal with one email doesn't mean I need to deal with the next email and so on. That 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 one piece of interaction really, really frustrates me. I think this only happens on the Mac. 
probably happens on iOS as well, actually, but I, I don't use them. Uh, uh, I think it happens on iOS as well. I'm 90% sure it happens on iOS. I never even think about this behavior. This 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 goes right to the heart of how differently we deal with email, which should be a, di- a separate show. Um, so that's your only complaint? That's my major complaint. Right. I, found, I found mail to be a little bit slow. Um, it frustrates me that if somebody, if you have, if you could have exchanged a million emails with someone, but if they are not in your address book, they will not populate in the to field. When you start mm. writing a new email, like if you open a brand new email and just type like gray, if I don't have your email address in my address book, it just refuses to find them, but will find mm. them magically if I try to search for you. See, it seems like this sounds like a feature to me. These both sounds are, these both are features. Yeah, and they are features that I find useful in Mailbox. Okay, so you use Mailbox, that's mm-hmm. yours? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And their Mac app is rough because it's a beta. Yeah. So it has a million other problems. But well, the features of Mailbox, the system, the stuff that I really like, like the ability to uh, organize messages into any arbitrary view that you want. So you mm-hmm. can drag and drop them around the list, uh, around the inbox. You can set things <sighs> to snooze. I really like that. Yeah. Um, all of those features are, are great features that I enjoy very much. Yeah, we'll have to talk about this more in detail. That sounds like a terrible way to deal with email. No, it's the best way to deal with email. It's, it sounds terrible. It's the best. It sounds terrible. The best. So you Definitely. use mail universally? Yep. <laughs> the trick is, though, I don't really look at my email very much anymore. <laughs> All I do is have an app that just archives everything, so it's it's not really a problem. <laughs> it's getting close to that lately. <laughs> Okay, Connor asked this question. This is so genius. Uh, I love this. So in regards to last week when we were talking about complaints about the Apple Watch where you were saying that you wished uh, that the watch charged quickly so you could wear it to Mm. sleep and to wake you up and then you could like maybe put it down for 20 minutes, it charged and you can go about your day and then Mm. pick it up and you're ready and the watch has got enough battery life to get through the day because you missed the sleep tracking stuff. Mm-hmm. Connor asked, why don't you just have redundant watches like you have redundant iPads? Charge one during the daytime, which you use at nighttime. You put it on when you go to sleep. It wakes you right. up silently. Then you right. could charge that one and pick up the new one and reuse that for the day. <laughs> it's funny timing for this one because between between the last episode of Cortex and this one, I actually, there are two Apple Watches in my house right now because my real Apple Watch, the one that I had my heart set on, finally arrived. And the one that I had been using, I've been thinking of as just my temporary Apple Watch. Oh, you got the super fancy. I got the Evil Empire Edition, which is that Black Link yeah. bracelet one, which I really, really like. I'm very happy to have that. I very much look forward to seeing that and yeah. hopefully trying it on. Will you allow that? <laughs> no way, man. Really? <laughs> Why would you let me try your watch on? I, I'm not sure if you're aware. This is the most intimate device that Apple has ever made. I'm not. I'm not letting you try on the most intimate device that's that's uh, attached to my body all the time. That would feel really weird. It'd feel feel no, very weird. That would not be weird. I, I don't know, man. I, I I would never let anyone try on my my old watch. You have in possession one of my prized pens. Oh, that pen, by the way, man, that is awful. I keep meaning to tell you, that pen is terrible. Okay. I have many things to complain about that pen when we meet in person on Tuesday. Okay. That's been sitting in my bag. It was just another option for you. That was Waiting all. to get rid of that thing. Well, you can give it back to me. <laughs> uh, but to return to the watches. So I happen to have two watches. The The one that I have been using is on its way out now. It is uh, it is destined for a person who doesn't yet know they're going to receive it. But it is, it is basically going to be... Uh, elsewhere i'm not keeping two watches but the thing that i noticed when i got the new one is that apple i think quite sensibly doesn't actually allow you to have two watches set up with one phone even if you wanted to like let's let's say you're some crazy multimillionaire and you want to have multiple gold watches apple won't let you do that you have to unpair the watch and like go re go through a kind of load from backup irritating semi setup process for switching over the watches so even if you wanted to be a crazy person who had redundant watches which i think is a little bizarre a- apple is saying no on this one they're, they're putting down their foot and going you can't have redundant watches i don't know if you can start throwing the bizarre tag around you you but- do have like three ipads in use yes but there are uses for all those ipads yeah but there will be a use for the two watches one to track your sleep 
<laughs> want to go about your day with. Um, okay, but but even even if even if you could pair two watches, this this whole notion of using the watch to track your sleep as a redundant one that wouldn't it wouldn't work anyway. The watch isn't designed for that, and I don't think this a sleep tracking with the current state of it would even work overnight anyway. So was, there is no point in the world to having two Apple watches. There's there's this is a solution for nobody's problem. Like this, this accomplishes nothing. Whereas, uh, you know, there are many, many cases of, of more than one iPad being useful. This is not possible. However, however, mm. since we talked about the watches last time, I thought, oh, I have an idea. There's something I can do which sort of works. And I've been trying this for five days and so far, I've been pretty happy. So here's what I've been up to, Mike. Most days, my Apple Watch battery doesn't get below 50 or sometimes 60%. Because I don't use it for almost anything except receiving notifications. I don't use glances. I don't use apps. I don't use any of this stuff. So my battery life is already pretty great. So what I've been doing is I thought, OK, here's, here's what's going to happen. I am actually going to wear the watch overnight and set an alarm on it to wake me up in the morning through the Taptic engine. So what I have been doing is when I'm getting ready for bed, I've been putting the watch on the charging stand. And in the time it takes me to get ready for bed, doing the, like the brushing of the teeth, flossing, you know, all the stuff you do. The watch can almost always get from 50 or 60% back up to 80 or 90%. And then, this is the trick, I put the watch into airplane mode before I go to sleep. So this way, it's not even trying to connect to anything wirelessly. It's just sitting there on my wrist. And then in the morning, when the alarm time rolls around, it silently taps my wrist until I wake up. And so far, I really like this. It's obviously not tracking my sleep, but I have been really bothered by not having an effective alarm in the morning that doesn't also bother my wife. The, the Sleep Cycle app I have been using on my phone has been... The app is very good, it's just my circumstances in using it are not, uh, with using it with the iPhone 6 Plus, the stuff we talked about last time. So for these five days, I have been very happy with my silent alarm which is the watch in the morning and i haven't been having any any battery battery problems doing this at all so that's what i've been up to that's what i've been testing out so you're not like chasing an empty battery it's not like every day it goes down by five percent for example no that's what i've been keeping an eye on i have temporarily put on the uh the battery indicator as a complication on my watch just so i could keep an eye on okay how is this working how is this going and it does not seem like I'm chasing down the battery. But even if it is, the, the Apple Watch gets to 80% so fast that if I just accidentally leave it a little bit longer one night, it'll it'll charge up more. Uh, like last night, it happened to get almost up to 100% because uh, whatever it was, I just took a little longer getting ready for bed than I normally do. So it, it definitely is the case that within this window of sleeping with it overnight in airplane mode, and then using it throughout the day, when I put it on the charging stand at night, the watch is still very consistently at 50 or 60. And then in that 20 or 30 minutes, it gets up to 80 or 90%. And then, you know, you could do the same in the morning when you're getting ready in the morning. Put it on the charter, go get ready in the morning. I originally thought that I needed to do that, but it became obvious pretty quickly that I didn't actually need to do that. So if I don't have to... Char I don't, like, I, I always want to think about fewer things, and so... I think this is perfectly satisfactory, the charging it at night just before I go to bed. Use it, as a, use it as a silent alarm clock in the morning. I'm very happy with this. That's my suggestion for people who have watches. That is a life hack. It's not a life Don't use that. that it's like a dirty word. <laughs> That's why I like stuff. to use it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you're doing it because, because of what this word has become. But let's not get into this habit. But you are hacking your life, though. So it's, it's not you know. even remotely a life hack. Okay, life trick. I'm not accepting any of this nonsense. It's a thing that I am trying that is working out so far. 
So if you'd like to leave us with feedback or questions or comments, there's a couple of great ways you can do this. You can leave us feedback on the thread for this week's episode, right? Mm-hmm. I got that right, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Thread. Yeah, that's good. You can go to cgpgray.reddit.com and you will find uh, probably be relatively close to the top and you'll want to look for the episode four of Cortex, which of course this one is. Our show notes mm-hmm. are at relay.fm slash Cortex slash four. And you can also uh, tweet with your questions. If you just use the hashtag AskGray, then I'll be able to pick them up and consider them for later episodes. Bye-bye, Mr. Gray. Bye, Mike.